Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. As you heard in the prayer and in the introduction, our speaker is Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost. He has uh, taught here at Dallas Seminary for well over 50 years. He pastored for almost 30 years along uh, uh, with his teaching, written numerous volumes, has taught so many of us so much over the years. Would you join me in welcoming our dear colleague, Dr. Dwight Pentecost. Have you noticed the similarity between a Dallas Cowboy preseason opening game and the first week of chapel? <laughs> For that first preseason game, the coach always sends the all stars out to start. <laughs> Who started chapel? Dr. Bailey and Dr. Camel. And after those stars have played a f <laughs> few games, they bring on the rookies and the backups. <laughs> now, starting my 57th year on the faculty, I can't fall into the class of rookie. <laughs> but I do accept third string backup. <laughs> and then the coach Fearing that under those backups, the crowd will disappear for the last few plays of the fourth quarter, they always bring in a big name. And so, Friday, it'll be Dr. Chase Toussaint. Now, even the third string backups, when they appear on the field, are dressed as the stars. So I watched, and Dr. Bailey had a suit, dress shirt, tie, as did Dr. Camel. So not leaving the role of backup, I tried to at least dress <laughs> for the role. Early in his ministry, our Lord called 12 men to himself. And in Mark chapter 3, says he chose them that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. <laughs> Chosen to be with him. He has assumed the position of rabbi to teach them. And he would invest himself in them to prepare them for the ministry. That he was successful as a teacher is evidenced by the fact that from among those men, four were set apart later in their ministry 
to record both the words and the works of Jesus Christ. They had been well taught. They retained what they had been taught. By the Spirit's enablement, they could re record for our edification what they had been taught. You are perhaps under the deception that obtaining a degree, degree from Dallas Theological Seminary, you're going to be equipped for a fruitful, profitable ministry. That won't do it. Over the years, I have been called upon multitudes of times to provide recommendation for graduates from churches, from schools, from organizations that were looking for men. I have yet to be inquired as to the academic record of any applicant. They're not interested in what you did in Greek and Hebrew theology. Your minds may be filled to overflowing to what has been presented to you. But that's not the basis for a successful ministry. We read that Jesus spoke to those 12 men who had spent three years listening to and observing him. And then he said, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. The relationship of a servant to his master, his relationship based on mind. What you know. And that knowledge was not the basis for a successful ministry. But the relationship of friend to friend moves out of the area of the mind and the intellect and moves into the heart. And so those men who had been so thoroughly taught that they could inscripturate what they had been taught had to move from the mind to the heart. And that is why in the upper room, as Jesus is about to dis dispense those men into the ministry that will be entrusted to them, he gave specific instructions that constitute the, the basis for a profitable, fruitful ministry. And it's in three simple words. Abide in me. Abide in me. 
I think back to early in my ministry here of a young man came to us from quite a distinguished college background. He was a member of the basketball team from UCLA that his senior year had won collegiate national basketball championship. There was an aura that overshadowed him. He handled it well, but was respected because of what he had gained as an athlete. He was a good student, did well academically, he often would stop by my office and came in one day all excited. And I said, what's happened? And he told of a prominent church in Southern California that was in the process of searching for a pastor. And they had invited him to come and preach. He could hardly contain himself. And I could rejoice with him. <clears throat> His appointment was several weeks in the future. And he, he came to share his excitement with me. When he had preached and returned, I said, how did it go? And he said, oh, I had a great time. How does your message go? He said, oh, I wowed him. <laughs> and then I noticed that he wasn't coming. And so I looked him up. And I said, have you heard anything from that church in California? He said, no, I haven't heard a word. And he had expected to hear. Disappointment. And after several visits, I said to him, tell me, what was the message that you proclaimed? And he said, I preached on the various interpretations of Genesis 1-2, depending on what interpretation you give to the connective cow. <laughs> I am sure he could delineate the effects of the interpretation. But I could understand why the Pope Committee erased his name <laughs> from consideration. See, that was mind to mind. And while he thought he had wowed him because he felt he'd have the approval of the entire Hebrew department. It was pointless. Until what has been transformed from your mind to your heart. It'll be empty, cold, pointless. That's why when they were in the upper room, Jesus said, without me, 
ye can do nothing. John had made it very clear in the closing introduction to his gospel that Jesus Christ had become incarnate so that he would be the channel through which God the Father would make himself known to those who should have known him through the evidence of creation, but who had rejected natural revelation as, as disclosing the existence, and the power, and the beauty of God. Christ had come to make the Father known. And Christ's words, he affirms, were not his words, but were the Father's words spoken through him. The works that he did were not to attract attention to himself, although they did validate his claim to be the Son of God and the Messiah. Every work was to reveal the Father to them so that they might know the Father. And therefore in John 17, when Jesus said, if I can paraphrase it, for the same reason You sent me into the world. I now am sending them into the world. John 14 informs us that the believer is indwelt by God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the triune God is at work through the indwelling Christ to do through you as a believer what he did when he walked the earth to reveal the Father. Christ was not revealing himself through the miracles he performed as much as revealing the Father. The Father saw his covenant people as blind and Christ performed miracles of restoring sight to blind in order that they might know that God the Father, in revealing himself, is removing spiritual blindness. God's covenant people should be united in worship, praise, adoration, thanksgiving to the God whom the Son is revealing. And Jesus removed muteness from lips that they might know that the Father is loosing their tongues that they might worship him. So many of Jesus' miracles had to do with healing cripples. They could not walk normally. But Jesus could strengthen the weak knees and the feeble ankles so they could walk a new walk. 
And God the Father was renewing the walk. Those whose walk was not keeping with his perfection. Jesus, Jesus would stop a funeral procession. And restore a deceased son to his mother. Or would call Lazarus from the grave in order that to reveal that his father was the giver of life to those who were dead. Galatians 2.20 tells us we have been crucified with Christ. Yet we live. Yet not we, but Christ lives in us. Christ, from his residence within us, is seeking to do through us that which he came to do in the time that he walked among men to reveal the Father. To reveal the Father. Now, the only way we can do that is to be in such personal, intimate relationship to the Son that the Son is unhindered and unhampered in his work of revealing the Father through us. My second pastorate took me into the suburbs of Philadelphia. And during that time, the 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia was occupied by Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse. a mighty teacher, an expositor of the word, who held the attention of all that area of our country. Dr. Barnhouse had a peculiar relationship with his church for recognizing his gifts, his governing board of elders granted him permission to absent himself from the pulpit provided he provided an acceptable substitute. And the occasion came when he made arrangements to be absent from his pulpit for two weeks. And he invited a young man who had had almost no experience in the ministry to occupy his pulpit. I knew that young man well. He shared with me how petrified he was the thought of walking into Dr. Barnhouse pulpit to teach the word. Now at that time, the business department of Philadelphia College of Bible where I taught had one of Dr. Barnhouse Board of Elders serving as a business manager. A few days after that young man had completed his two weeks in Dr. Barnhouse's ministry, 
I saw that businessman. And I said, how did things go? What reception was given to that young man? And he paused for a minute. And then looked at me and said, the contrast was notable. He said, Dr. Barnhouse teases from his head. That young man taught from his heart and moved the congregation. That's what Christ is trying to impart when he uses a figure from nature to reveal his concept of abiding. The word meno, to abide, can have several significances. It can refer to simply a geographical connection. It could be said that Jesus changed his residence and abode in Capernaum. A physical, external relationship. But that's not abiding. And so to get it across, Jesus used the figure of a grape plant. Let me put it this way. You may take a two before, sharpen it, and with a heavy hammer, pound it into the ground. That stake is in the ground, but it is not abiding. One thing is abiding when that which is abiding is drawing from its native element, that which nourishes and supports and, so, and maintains its life. So the one who wanted to start a vineyard would prepare the soil, the native element for that plant. Then it would plant that grape into the ground. And through its root system, would reach out into its native element and take into itself from that in which it abides, that which nourishes, supports, and sustains that grape. And eventually, that in which that grape is abiding will reproduce itself through the branch and produce a luscious bunch of grapes. That's not the fruit of the vine, that's the result of abiding 
in its native element. And that element into which we have been introduced is the element of the sun. And so he who has come to reveal the Father becomes that which nourishes, supports, sustains the imparted life that belonged to the grape and produces fruit to the benefit of the owner of the vineyard. Abiding is not the relationship of mind to mind, but heart to heart. You will get out of here with heads so full You'll be, it'll be hard for you to live with yourself, let alone your wife. <laughs> but that does not guarantee a fruitful, successful ministry. Unless you allow Christ to infuse that plant with his life, there will be no fruit. Christ said, my words are not my words, they're my Father's words. My works are not mine, they, they are my Father's. And when even as late as in the upper room, one of his own came to him and said, show us the Father. I, from years of experience in a classroom, would not be at all surprised if hearing that question, Jesus hadn't sighed a deep sigh. What do you think I've been doing for these three years? And he said, I've revealed the Father by my words and by my works. And until Christ gives you a passion, transfers from your head to your heart, a love for him and a love for his word and a passion to proclaim it. Your ministry can be evangelical but dead. And until you can get your roots so deeply into him that he uses you as the branch through which he reveals the Father. Your ministry will be fruitless. Get your roots. where the root can transfer all that he is through you to those to whom he ministers. Our Father, give us a passion. to abide.
so that through this age, the Father is revealing himself. through Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen.